So again, Pastor, thank you so much for letting me. You could have done a lot of other things, but you let me be here today. And uh, I brag about you on Facebook all the time. Uh, when I was down in North Carolina, I was bragging about you and all those folks down there know you and love you and respect you. And I just took a selfie just a minute ago of me and him with all y'all behind us. <laughs> and I'm going to throw it up on Facebook here in just a little while and brag about being here with him. I'll get more hits because of him than because of me. That's smart on my part, right? Get me some more friends. Even if they don't like me, they're my friends, you know. That's where Facebook is, you know. Turn with me to the Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. For those of you that have been my students over the past few months, I especially greet you. And how many of you are there again? Let me see your hand. Yeah, I, I recognize you. Some of you more than others because you talk back to me, you know. But thanks for being a part of Leader Labs. I hope I've been a help to you. And if you haven't been a part of Legal Act, then I'm going to challenge you in April, April 12 and 13, Friday and Saturday, will be our last set of Legal Labs. And uh, I encourage you to come as we talk about change. Man, anybody involved in change? Is the world changing right now? We talk about change and how to handle change, even how to lead change. And then after that, we're going to talk about on Saturday, our final we're going to talk about conflict. Conflict in the ministry. Conflict in the church. Now, y'all don't have that up here in New Jersey, but down south, we have this thing called conflict. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's a tough thing. If you've been in the church longer than two weeks, you know what, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Conflict happens. It's not if it happens, it's when it happens. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that in the lab. So come back out and, and, and be with us. Bring somebody. And I know that uh, you'll be blessed. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking today. It's 12 o'clock. And he told me that I, I had to let you go by 3. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to worry today. My flight's boring at 3. And it takes a while to get the new one. <laughs> And, and I got me this smart aleck young man that's been taking care of me all weekend. I'm not well, I wouldn't dare call him out, but Chevron's his name. <laughs> he talks back to me and stuff. And I said, How long does it take to get to the airport, my brother? And he said, Well, you the preacher, you make up your mind. <laughs> so you just preach how long you want. <laughs> well, I got news for you. If I miss my plane, I'm coming home with you. <laughs> and she's gonna say, No, he's not. <laughs> Uh, I love Mr. Chevron. He's, he's a good guy. I could whoop him in basketball any day, but he's good. <laughs> Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him who is able, do you believe that? Yes. To do exceeding abundantly above all. all. Say all. all. We ask or think. According to the power that works. Where? Yes. See, we like to quote the first half of that verse and then we don't seem to hear that, that last little bit. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or can even think. But listen to the qualifier. According to the power that works in you. You. Praise God. I don't know if you guys sing it up here, but you've got great kids. I should have asked this probably when they when they were here in the children's church. But down south, we have this this song. It's a kid's song, and it goes something like this: I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a great big package of. Well, y'all do know that song, don't you? Potentiality. Man, I think we could, we could almost stop right there if we could really hear those words, couldn't we? And, and I really think that that's part of what Ephesians 3 and 20 is trying to tell us, is that we all sitting here, every person sitting here today, yes, according to God's Word, is a great big passage. A 
of potentiality. And God wants to be at work in all of us doing exceeding abundantly above all we ask or can even think. Amen. Because His power wants to be at work in us. Yes, God. Now, I really believe that. Amen. Now, look with me too at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. And I'm going to read through verse 29. Let's take a look in the NIV, the New International Version. Think of what you were when you were called. Now, now this is the Apostle Paul, of course, and I just want to pause there and ask you, is there anybody in the house that can remember what you were when you were called? When you were saved? And, and listen to what he says. Not many of us were wise by human standards. Not many of us were influential. Not many were wealthy. Not many of us were even from important families. And not many of us were in powerful places. But God still chose you. Amen. How many of you are glad that He chose you? Amen. God chose you. What if? What if there is a you that has never seen the light of day? What if there is a you, talking about this potential that's dormant and laid up inside of us, what if there is a you that represents a life, the you now, that represents a life that has settled for less than what you can actually be. I asked the people in the labs this question, and it's a powerful question. Are you ready? How good could you be? If you were to reach all of that potential that God says is there and all that His power can do in you, how good could you be? Man, that's a great question to ponder, isn't it? What we're talking here is to try for a moment to envision the best version of yourself. And what the Apostle is telling us that through God's Spirit, once we are saved, we cannot even imagine how good that person can be. Now, I'm not just talking about good in terms of moral or ethical sense. I'm talking about good in effectiveness, good in potential, good in becoming the, the, the person of quality, a person that makes a difference in your world. That we cannot even really imagine that. But what happens is, days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and then all of a sudden, we wake up one morning, and we find that, oop, this is who I am. And too many of us, watch this, find, if we're honest, if we're brutally honest, that we have settled. We have just settled. For a life that is less than. We know that it's less than because somewhere in our early years, elementary years, it might even have been as you were a young girl or a young boy. Or as a teenager, an adolescent, or a young adult in college, or just starting out in life, you had dreams. They were great dreams. Because every once in a while, you, yes, you got a glimpse, even if it was a little glimpse, you got a little glimpse of how good you could be. And man, it was gratifying. But then life happens. And we settle for less than. I've got bad news and I've got good news. Let me give you the bad news first. You have made the choices that have gotten you to where you are today. Amen. Life is made up of choices. Yes. 
Now, can I give you the good news? You have made the choices that have gotten you where you are today. The moral of that story is you can start today. No better time than to start today making better choices. And starting to realize, stop settling and start realizing the person that's on the inside. How many of you can say, yes, Dr. Norman, I remember the day I had a dream of what I could actually be, that I could be, I could have been somebody, I could, that, that you remember that day when, when, when it was there deep inside burning like a fire on the inside of you? You know, it reminds me of August 28, 1963, down in Washington, D.C., when a man stood on the mall there in our nation's capital. And he preached a sermon to thousands of people. And certain words of that sermon have reverberated all around the world. You know that sermon, right? Martin Luther King Jr. stood there and he preached. And what's the title of the sermon? I have a dream. What is it? I have a dream. Now, you know what's sad about this is that many of us can say that, but many of us, I'm amazed at it, have never really listened to the whole sermon. Did you know that there are many more phrases and words and ideas and concepts and dreams inside that sermon than just that one I have dreamed? Because he unpacks his dream. If you if you you listen, you go Google that. You go to YouTube and you listen to that sermon today sometime. And if you don't get Holy Ghost goosebumps, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but Pastor Martin said, "I have a dream." And many of us can relate to that because at one point in our life we had one too. Hebrews chapter eleven, verse one. Oh, it's a powerful verse, but it says this. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know what a dream is? A dream is a hope. It is something that you hope for. And the Bible says that faith is the very substance of things hoped for. What do you hope for? Is there anything in your life that you come to church today hoping for? That's, that's part of this thing we call faith. It is the evidence of things not seen, but I hope for it. It hasn't happened yet, but I hope for it. Another version says, not only is it the evidence of things not seen, it is the conviction of things not seen. You see, hope that I'm talking about today is not wishful thinking. Hope is the hope that I'm talking about, the hope that God talks about, the dream that the Lord's talking about is the kind of dream, the kind of hope that grabs hold of you and begins to cause you to order your feet and your behavior to start doing things differently, making different choices, so that day by day, week by week, month by month, your life, your behavior, you begin to look more like the dream. Yes. Yeah. stuff happens. Yes. Hope is power. Yes. Pastor Donnie told you and some of you that have been with me know that uh, for the last 12, 13 years I spent most of my life in Southeast Asia. I was the superintendent of Southeast Asia for the churches of God. Of those six countries, Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and Burma and Sri Lanka. And I spent more time over there during that decade or more than I did in the United States. When I was back in the United States, I was raising money. And yes, Pastor, you and your church were very faithful to that ministry while I was there and helped us to build a city for the poor in Cambodia. Patterson Church. City is growing and multiplying, and God is still blessing. And now there's schools, and there's there's hospitals and clinics, and the entire area has grown. They can't even build anything else there because of now the water and the electricity and the streets and all the businesses that grew up around it. They all have jobs now. And the kids are now getting.
So here I was in Southeast Asia. But let me take you back 15 years to the second trip that I made to Cambodia. The first trip I went with the former director. The second trip I made about a year later. I was the director. Now here I am in Cambodia, one of the poorest countries in the world. It's 99.9% .9 Buddhist. And, and the Church of God not only has made me superintendent of Southeast Asia, but now I'm the executive director of People for Care and and this little guy from the south is now wondering how in the world am I going to reach Buddhist people who don't even know a Bible story, don't, don't know who Jesus is, and how am I going to minister to people who, who are poor? We were out at the Tomley Sack Lake. Tomley Sack Lake is called Tomley Sack. It means the Great Lake. It is the largest freshwater lake in all of Southeast Asia, and over a million refugees live on the lake. And I'm, I'm not on the lake, it is a water world. They live in their boats and their houseboats and all their stuff there on the lake. Uh, they have little stores and they have hospitals or pharmacies, and yes, they have uh, uh, service stations, fuel stations, everything on the lake. Some of them never touch dry ground. In fact, they get seasick if they touch dry ground because they've never been on anything that's firm. Their whole life has been moving. So I'm going out in a van with four or five other preachers. It's an old dusty road. I see the lake. There's water on both sides. We're about to stop. And there's these the thatch roofed houses and they've got tarp all over them and there's dirt floors or stick floors and they're 40 feet out of the ground because the water rises 40 feet or goes down 40 feet here in the year whether it's the monsoon rainy season or the dry season so this is this is a strange place but i look over in the heat and the dust it's about 120 degrees the air conditioning is not working in the van and there, you know how these and dust is rolling and you're sweating and it's getting all over you and you're miserable. And, and I'm saying to the Lord, what in the world am I doing here? And not only that, what am I going to say to these people? How am I going to minister to these people? And I look out the window and there is a lady sitting there. She might have been 40, but she looked 80 to 100 because the years had wore on her that bad. And she's sitting there in the dirt. Her little children are running around naked around her and her little house, if you can call it that, is behind her with hardly nothing in it. And it seemed that time just slowed down almost to a stop. You ever been in a situation like that where you look back on it and it's almost at time, you know, time's relative. Sometimes time flies and sometimes you feel like time is just going so slow that you can, you can divide every tick on the clock. Yes. Right? Well, this is one of those moments when it's going slow and I look out the window and my eyes meet her eyes. She's sitting on her heels on the ground. Have you ever tried to do that? Sit on your heels. Try it sometime. If I sat down on my heels, you'd have to carry me out of here. <laughs> because my knees would probably snap. But they could sit there for, for days like that. She's sitting on her heels. And I look into her eyes and she stares right through me. It's like she didn't even see me. And as time just seemingly goes by so slow, I'm looking here. Here's the four words that I felt like the Holy Spirit dropped into my spirit. It became the marching order of my life while I was in Southeast Asia. It will be the marching order of my life for Leader Labs and the rest of my life. You ready? Inspire hope. Empower potential. What am I supposed to do, Lord? What's my calling during this season of my life? And the Holy Spirit said, inspire hope. Empower potential. And then you know what I found out? You don't have to go to Cambodia to find people who need hope. Amen. Amen. There are people listening to me right now who need hope. It's a sad thing when you reach a place in life, no matter what your circumstances, when you feel like you have no hope. You know, what, you know what she was saying to me? She was saying to me, my today will be like yesterday, and my tomorrow will be just like today. That's what it feels like when you what? Have no hope. Right? You just give up. 
that I found out that people all over the United States and everywhere I go, people in my labs, people that I speak to on Sunday mornings, we have Christians who reach points and places of desperation where we feel like at times we have no hope. But the Lord told me then, He said, give them the good news because the good news, what is the gospel? Good news. Good news. Give them the good news that there is hope in Jesus. To have faith in me. Faith is And faith is the substance of things. Tell them. There, if you can just have just a little bit of hope. What do you say? A grain of faith like a grain of a mustard seed. But faith, in faith, there's a kernel of hope. And that kernel of hope, if you could just reach out to God in the midst of your desperation and just ignite that grain, just let a little tear fall on that seed, boom! Possibilities. In the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the hopeless, hopeless terror, that there is hope. I mean, you believe this. Praise God. Empower potential. Because in every person born all around the world, there are people who have potential. Yes. Empower it. Ignite it. Help them to see it. Help them to reach for it. Yes. I, I, see, I believe that God has a plan and that God has a destiny for everybody. everybody. Yes. I really believe that. Yes. If we can begin to figure it out, it's like, have you ever heard of Pastor Rick Warren? Yes. He's out in California. He wrote a New York Times best-selling book. It's one of the most popular books in all of the history of mankind. Did you know that? Yes. Purpose Driven Life. Yes. And if you haven't read it, I'm going to encourage you. You get that baby. Sit in to somebody. Purpose Driven Life. It's been read by so many people. It has added so much inspiration to people. You know why? Because people are looking for purpose. Yes. They're looking for the plan. Why am I here? I was in Bangkok, Thailand. And I happened to be by myself at this time, about to jump over to Vietnam and then back over to uh, uh, to Cambodia and then jump up to Laos and by myself and doing some leadership and some conflict management among these folks over there. And I'm, I'm pulling my little pullback behind me and I'm on a, a moving escalator, you know, the black escalator that, that moves. And as I'm moving, there's a glass wall. This airport's the largest passenger terminal in the world in Bangkok, Thailand. And, and I'm, there's this glass wall, and it says International House of Prayer. And I look in there, there's a bald head guy with, a, with an orange robe on, again, sitting down on his heels, and he's reading something. And it intrigued me, got my attention. And when I got off the moving escalator, I went back and got closer, put my face right up against the glass. Guess what that Buddhist monk, he might have been 20 years old, guess what he was reading? Purpose Driven Life. You see, everybody around the world, God put something on the inside of every person that gives them this inkling, just an intuition, a gut level feeling that we have a purpose. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. They are plans not to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. Praise God. So for those of us who, 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 who get to a place, or we have grandbabies, or we have kids, or we have people in the community, people we work with, people that we bump into, people we go to church with who reach that season of life to where they feel like they have no hope, be the first to tell them that God has a plan for you. And Did you know that suicide it is an all-time high? Yes, yes. Not only in the United States, but in the world today. Yes. Showing us that people are reaching these places of having no hope. When I was growing up, Uncle 
Uncle Sam. Anybody know what Uncle Sam means? <laughs> Military. <laughs> and Uncle Sam wore a hat and he was dressed in red, white, and blue, and they always had these these posters. Does anybody remember the poster of Uncle Sam on that? Yes. Anybody here remember this? Yes. It, it'll date you. That's why you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> but he said, I want you to be all you can be. Be all you can be. And that phrase was so motivational that it has caused hundreds of thousands of men back then, now women, to enter into the military because they convince people that the military, and it does for a lot of people, helps them to be all. And I believe that God is reaching from His throne today and He's looking down at us and He's saying the same thing. I believe in you and I want you to be all that I have created you to be and I have a plan for you. Quit listening to the little negative pessimistic voices all around you that say that you're going to be hurt, that you're going to be hard, that you can't make it. You're too ugly. You're too fat. You're not educated enough. You're not wise enough. You don't have the right kind of family. You're in the wrong neighborhood. You're the wrong color. You're from the wrong region. You're from Jamaica. You're from this. You're from that. It can't happen. But quit listening to that stuff. And stop listening to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit because you're a Christian. You're a child of God. And He said, I know my friends for you. Quit listening to that stuff. Start listening to the Lord. And start ordering your footsteps. Yes. In accordance with that. Yes. And life can change. Mm -hmm. Listen. Who you are today is not who you can be. Who I am is not who I can be. Would you say it with me? Who I am is not who I can be. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Eyes have not seen. Look at you how good you are. Ears have not heard. Nor has it even entered into the heart or imagination of a man or a woman what God has prepared for those who love Him. Look at the criteria. You see, if we wrote that, if it was us running things, we would say you got to be have a certain education. Well, you need a master's degree. <laughs> you got to have a leader's lab certificate. <laughs> but look how simple it is. How many of you meet this standard? I love you. Yeah. Talking about the Lord. How many of you can say I love you? Well, here's the promise for you. Your eyes haven't seen it. Your ears haven't heard it. And you can never imagine what the Lord has prepared for you. Now you see, we, we look at that and we think that's heaven, ladies and gentlemen. And, and that's true, it can be applied to heaven. Heaven is ours. Hallelujah. Amen. But that's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the fulfilled life in Jesus on the here and now. But how many of us ever really reach out and grab hold of that? I want to grab hold of everything that I can. Yes. G. Campbell Morgan, an old preacher, he said it this way, God has planted in every believer a seed of potential. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. I call it potential on steroids. <laughs> because it's powerful. Yes. You can't imagine. I, I, I wish right now that I could pull an old grandma trick on you and come out and grab each one of you by the cheek and look you right in the eye where grandmother would and say, I'm talking to you. <laughs> because see, right now, everybody listening to me thinks I'm talking to somebody else. But no, 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 no. I'm talking. There was once a nobody named Ordinary who lived in the land of familiar. <laughs> Some of us feel like that sometimes. A 
A nobody named Ordinary who lived in the land of the field. But one day, Ordinary had a dream. That he or she was not just ordinary. They weren't really a nobody. But they were actually somebody. And that they were destined for greatness. Day after day went by and they never did anything about it. But one day, ordinary got enough punch, anointing, excitement, enthusiasm, encouragement, motivation, whatever it was, and took a deep breath and stepped out of the land of the living. On a journey to reach his own dream. I have traveled the world, living, and I don't mean that egotistically, it's a fact. I've taught leader labs in 32 countries. During my time in working in Southeast Asia, I went back and forth around the globe 53 times. I feel like I have permanent jet lag. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people and I've met with a lot of leaders. Because of our work in Cambodia and in Southeast Asia, I became very close to government officials in several different countries especially those in Cambodia, and received humanitarian awards, some of their highest humanitarian awards. And it moved beyond a political, non-government organization partnership to a very personal friendship. And often when I'm with these people, I get an opportunity to have dinner with them, to have lunch with them, and I'm not talking about just as groups, but they'll say, hey, let's go out to and when I'm with them, there's one question I always like to ask. You ready? Here it is. Tell me your story. And then I just sit back and listen. Man, I wish. I'm, I'm going to tell you one of them today. But watch this. We look at people. I look at you today. You look at me. We look at each other. And when we come to church, I look at you. Here's what I assume. Because you're so, you look so good. You're dressed so well. You clean up so good. That I look at you. And I listen to you sing, and I watch y'all hug each other, and the way you act here, and I assume that everything in your life has just been peachy clean. Y'all don't have any problems. I want to come up here. Now, would my assumption be correct? No. Have y'all been through some stuff? Yes. And I find that around the world. I, I sit and I listen to leaders and they are leading great. They're, they're, they're leading countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, tell me your story. And in just a few minutes, my jaw is laid on the table. And I'm yes. saying, what? <laughs> you came out of that? <laughs> You see, sometimes the pain, the loneliness, the isolation, the crises, the grief becomes the crucible through which the Lord God molds you and sets you to become the person you are. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You, you, you can cause that to make you bitter or make you better. And that's not just a praise, ladies and gentlemen. That's a truth. And the truth can set you free. One person. I, I wish I had time to tell you three or four, but one. One person that I knew grew up in an inner city. One person grew up in an inner city. This, this, this young man had it seemingly all together, but he was poor. Poor. I mean really poor. Poverty poor in an inner city. And, and, but what's this? One thing I found out about the poor while I worked in Cambodia was that you don't have to be in Cambodia to find poor people either. Yeah. Poor is relative. Yes. And poor people don't know they're poor. <laughs> you ever know that? Poor people don't know they're poor because everybody around them is poor. And they just helping each other. It, it, it's not until they get out of that if they're ever lucky enough and they see people that aren't poor that they have an epiphany 
But this, this young man was poor, living in the inner city. And everything in his life, he said, but as he was growing up, was, was okay. Until he was nine years old and he woke up one night and his sister had been shot to death in his front yard. It rocked his family's world, you can imagine. Five months later, his mother, that was the oak tree of their family, does that communicate? You know what I'm saying? When some, some, usually there's somebody in your family that's the old tree. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It could be grandma, grandpa, mama, daddy, an aunt, an uncle. But they're the old tree. In other words, everybody leans on them. And when, they, when they're gone, something happens and they, they're gone, the whole family disintegrates. Goes their own separate way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, this young man's mother was the old tree. And in five months, he watched his sister be shot to death and his mother die. And his daddy, who loved his mother, became an alcoholic overnight, drowning his grief with a bottle. The other brothers and sisters, he came from a large family, the other brothers and sisters were older and were gone and did not want to come back to the old home place there in the inner city. Why? Because it reminded them too much of their mother and of their sister. So they stayed away. Now a little boy who had been brought up in a very secure home, even though it was poor, a very secure home, was now left to fend for himself in an inner city. And a nine-year-old boy found himself now for years <coughs> trying to hide from the home where there were a bunch of drunks and alcoholics. Oftentimes not being in school, oftentimes sleeping in ditches and old abandoned apartment houses because he was trying to find a place that was safe and secure. Oftentimes hiding on weekends in an old theater because they played two and three movies on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and he'd find himself there for a quarter he could watch all movies. And so that was a place in the darkness where he could hide from the street games and he could hide from all the drunks and the people and he hid himself there. By the time he was 12, 13, 14, not only was he smoking cigarettes, but he was drinking, sniffing glue, sniffing gas. He was doing hallucinogenics. He was hitting up cocaine. Heroin, whatever the case may be, snorting cocaine, hitting up heroin, doing everything in the streets that the street people were doing now is a part of a street gang. And they began to get him selling daily. By the time he was 15 and 16, he was doing really, really well. He had been arrested three different times, and on the last time, hair way down the ear, earrings in his ears, blue jeans and tennis shoes, and just, just a rebellious lifestyle. Crime, and all the stuff that goes with it. But the last time the police got him, they got him at his high school, dealing drugs at his high school. They took him and they kicked him out of his state and they kicked him out of his high school. They sent him away for a year thinking that that would rehabilitate him. It didn't really do that. He came back after a year and went back to the same high school even though they didn't want him there. But something happened. Something clicked. He saw a basketball player, a girl basketball player that was all conference and he was attracted to her. So he started showing up at all her games. And afterwards, when she would walk out of the gym, and he and all his long hair and all his reputation would say, uh, you know, can we go out somehow? To which for months she said, absolutely not. He was persistent. Until finally one day she said, okay, I'll go out with you. But you've got to go where I want to go. You know where she took him? She took him to church. He hadn't been to church. Don't you love it when unchurched people go to church? Yeah. I said, don't you love it when unchurched yeah. people go to church? He hadn't been to church. So he goes to church with her that day and sees things he's never seen before. A different class of people, a different culture of people. He, he didn't know that this, that this stuff existed. And not only had she taken him to church, you know what she had taken him to? A Pentecostal church. <laughs> she took him to a church 
church of God. Amen. No. Uh. And he just stared and looked and, and wondered what was happening, what was going to be like. And when the altar call was given, he ended up walking down to the altar, not really knowing what he was doing, just being drawn to the altar, drawn to the altar, and crying. The street gang guy don't cry, but he's crying. Embarrassed, kind of is crying, and he's crying, and he finds himself being surrounded by 30, 40 teenagers who are crying and praying for him, and he hears a voice that sounds very similar to a police officer's voice, and he scares him because he thinks, oh my, God's a policeman. God's voice sounds like a policeman's voice. And he looks up at him, and it's a highway patrolman. And the highway patrolman said this, said, what we've tried to do for years, God has just done in a matter of seconds. Wow. Now watch this. The boy gets up out of the altar, he leaves, he goes home, asks his dad to take him to get his hair cut. He said he'd never seen his dad move that fast in his life. <laughs> he went out, got his hair cut way up above his ears. I mean, really trying to, went back to church that night. The preacher read, thought he recognized him. Is that the young man that gave his heart to Jesus this morning? And he stood up and said, yes. Now he never spoke in front of a group in his life. Didn't really understand what was going on. Something was happening inside of him. And, and the preacher told him, said, testify. Listen, unchurched people don't know what we mean when we say testify. But in context, he said, it sounded kind of like say something. But he got up out of his seat, walked all the way to the front, pushed the big preacher out of the way, and talked about his life, his experience in Jesus for the next 15 minutes. So when people started getting up out of their seats and coming to the altar, and, and people all in the altar praying and asking God to do something. He went to his high school the next morning. He walked into his high school and people were wondering what, and the world happened to him. <laughs> professors and teachers and administrators, what happened? And he would just say, I gave my heart to Jesus yesterday. And when he would say it, big old tears would blow out of his cheeks and everybody was happy. And he started around lunchtime telling people, meet me at the church tonight at 7 o'clock and I'll tell you more. Right. See, something was going on. Well, around 1.32 o'clock, the girl that took him to church found him and said, you can't be inviting people to church on Monday night. We don't have church on Monday night. He said, we do now. More than 70 teenagers met him and that young lady Hallelujah. at church on Monday night for the next 10 weeks to have you for That little poor boy from an inner city went on to be the very first person in his large family to graduate from high school. He went on to receive a calling, of course. And he went to Lee University and he graduated with no help, debt free from Lee University. He went on to get a master's degree a Master of Divinity degree, three and a half years, debt free. He went on to pastor in the Church of God for more than 33 years. He went on to get a PhD in organizational leadership to become the superintendent of Southeast Asia, to become the executive director of People for Care and Learning. And that young man is training leaders all
listen to this. I am the least likely person to be standing up here talking. Now you can get my book. Lucky number eight. I wish I had some. They sold out. Every one of them. Second print sold out. But the ones I brought here, they're gone. But you can get it on Amazon.com. Lucky number eight. You go $14.95. They'll send it to you. You don't need to read it. You just need to give it to everybody. And just say there's hope. I, I don't care how bad off they are. I don't care what situation they're in. There's hope. Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost is in the business of taking people like us and making them somebody. I'm a turtle on post. You ever seen a turtle on post? <laughs> If you ever do, there's one thing you know. He didn't put himself there. And I'm a turtle on post. I'm here for one reason. One day, I let the hope of Jesus Christ start a fire inside of me. And that seed of potential, all that pain and all that crisis and all that torment, it all started watering that and it burst forth into these years. Four decades now of God growing me to be the man I am. He's still growing me today. Listen, listen to me. If it happened to and for me, it can happen for you. And it can happen for your grandbaby. It can happen for your son, your daughter. It can happen for somebody in your community. It can happen for somebody in your community. Listen, just have hope. How good could you be? That's what I keep asking myself. How good could I be? I don't know, but I'm having fun trying to find out. I got some dreams to write some books this, this year. I got some dreams to do leadership development more, bigger, better. I'm still dreaming because I keep asking myself, what's this? Two questions. What would I do if I wasn't afraid? And how good could it be? Ask those questions with me. Would you out loud? What would I do if I weren't afraid? Say it again. What would I do if I weren't afraid? Number two. How good could I be? Say it. How good could I be? Place your life in your right hand just like this. Would you do it? See, faith moves the hand of God. Faith is the substance of things that hoped for, the evidence, the conviction of things not seen. Just a little bit of faith. I'm not asking you to come to the altar today. All I'm doing is asking, would you just raise your hand with me? As an act of faith, God sees that. And in that, in that hand, symbolically, spiritual, I want you to think, here's my life, Father. If what I've said today has spoken to you, Here's my life, Father. Now close it up like this right here. I've got it. It's mine. But I'm going to give it to you. Just lift it up. This is my potential, Jesus. This is my potential. Now open that hand. I give it to you, Father. Help me to make the kind of decision starting today that order my private world and cause me to intersect with your dream, your plan for me. In the name of Jesus. Now lift the other hand and give God praise.